Uh, thank you, Mr. Rafferan, uh, for inviting me to this. But first of all, I have to say I'm very sorry my French is not good enough to make this presentation. But I assume everybody speaks English here. Of course. Of course, because 20 years ago when I came to Paris, when I asked for a direction on the street with a police officer, uh, nobody speak, spoke English to me. Uh, in the last few years, whenever I do this on the street, when the police officer saw the diplomatic plaque of my car, they came, smile first, and start speaking English to me first. So I, will, I assume every French people speak English now. Anyway, <clears throat> I would like to say uh, it's my honor to be invited by uh, the foundation, Mr. Rafferan. Uh, you are highly respected in China. That's a great friend of China. Uh, it's the first time I meet you, but I saw you many times in the Chinese television. So you are very popular. And uh, honored to be here to share my some views about China outside of China. Um, I would like to say, I know you are more interested in what is the China's role playing in this globalized world. Let me try to talk about from different angle, which is education. I use my experience in the last 20 years in UNESCO, which is an international organization specialized education, science, culture, to see what China has been doing in the last 20 years at the global level in terms of education. But first of all, I would like to say there's an assumption about Chinese education system. Chinese education system have a long history, you all know, starting from Confucius, a few thousands of years. But I have to just say today's Chinese education system is heavily influenced by the external world, particularly by the Western world. You can see in the last uh, something like 100, 150 years, a lot of uh, Chinese students came out of China and study abroad. I'm sure you, many of you know a lot of Chinese in France, in different countries. And this is a very strong, important factors to influence today's Chinese education system. This thing start 1870s. I'll give you an example of my own family. My, the uncle of my grandfather went to study in the United States in 1870 in Qing Dynasty. My grandfather went to the United States in 1909 as the first of the student from Tsinghua University study in the United States. My father in 1940s went to UK and my, myself went to Canada in, in 1980s. And my daughter came to France and Canada in the year 2000. So I have five generations, my family study abroad. But all five generations, when they finish study, they return to China. They do things in China. So I believe this is a something, the factor which really help to change Chinese education system. So if you look at the Chinese education system today, preschool, primary, secondary, higher education, university, vocational education, they're all similar with the Western education system. And the Chinese university, you, you know, heavily influenced by American model, which is not very necessarily good, but also we hope that can, like European model also can be uh, uh, shared, is shared. Now, let me see, uh, we'll say until, let's say all these uh, 100 something 50 years, this influenced. And then also you can see uh, that's before the People's Repu Republic was set up, was mainly the study student came from Western countries. And then of course, 1950s, there's a Russian, a uh, former Soviet Union. That was the influence of the students going there. But then after the Cultural Revolution, Again, all students went to Western countries, America, Western countries, and of course, Europe. So all these have really influenced to, for today's education system in China. Now let's see what uh, China's role in the international arena in terms of education. Uh, in 1971, China returned to United Nations, well, People's Republic. China was the founding member states. 
So in 1945, and the Chi Chinese government, then government, was a member of the UNESCO. And by that time, the, they have a delegation, and China was the member of UNESCO. But after the 1949, the People's Republic was not get in, so they wait until 1971, when People's Republic was readmitted to United Nations, same as UNESCO. So since then, China started playing their role in the international arena in terms of education. But these things, since 1971 until today, I can put into three different phases of China's role, and play different roles. At the beginning, say from 1971, when they return to United Nations, you return to UNESCO, until probably 1978, when the Cultural Revolution was over. During those period, the Chinese delegation, normally in United Nations, in UNESCO, they don't do, they didn't do much. They didn't talk. Normally, they kept silence. The only thing when they talk is if there's issue about Taiwan. And they say, okay, you should not do this to China's. That's the only time they, they open their mouths. For them, the business of UNESCO doesn't have too much relevant with Chinese realities. That's still cultural revolution. Second phase, starting after the cultural revolution over. So from the 1978, when this reform start by Deng Xiaoping, and then they start sending uh, students abroad and there's a lot of exchange, academic exchange started. And from that time, at the China, I would say, start kind of a more active participation in the UNESCO's work. By that time, I think this is the period, say, when China really want to learn things from outside the world. They were hungry. They want to have a new idea. They want to have the idea including education. So there was an influence there, like I have a, uh, you know, about concept education they have uh, in China. For example, even in 1972, you may heard your former Prime Minister Edgar Faure uh, published uh, a UNESCO report on um, uh, we call learning to be. This is about the concept of lifelong learning. And in 1996, uh, also Mr. Jacques Delors uh, published another UNESCO report. We say learning the treasure within. And this some concept, those already had influence in China. But however, in that period, Chinese participation was more, say, let's try to get something practically. And if you get a $50,000 from UNESCO to do a small projects, they were happy. So then they say, let's try to get things in rather than just say uh, doing something mutual things. So this is a, a period that uh, you can say China start getting involved, but not very actively. Uh, but those years, but I have to say also China contribute a lot for their own education development. Give you an example, like uh, you know in China in the last 30, 40 years, they got a significant work on literacy work. Their illiterate population drastically reduced and which make the global statistics of a literacy rate really, really improved, mainly because of China. And of course, and also in those years, uh, UNESCO promote this uh, called education for all, and also these uh, Millennium Development Goals. But the China find this is interesting, but they didn't link directly with the international uh, movement very closely. Basically, they still do a bit of a more their own system development, but only take the outside of the system as a reference. And I have to say, the thing changed a lot. And, then, and also, of course, in China, because the, they have a really increased the enrollment of the primary education, secondary education, and also technical vocational education. And today, also, they have a massive universities, which enrollment is 40% of the relative uh, uh, group. So you can see these are the really something China contribute a lot in the last, say, 30, 40 years, but at the beginning was not actively participate in a, 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 to play a visible and active role. And of course, and also in this, these things now start getting changed. I would say starting from uh, probably, say, seven, eight years ago, 
uh, this is a new trend. I would say this is a phase three. And it's difficult to say exactly from when, but it's, uh, I would say, from the last 10 years. Now China has become much more practically active, active participation in UNESCO and in the international arena. I think, of course, the company, they become a number two economic bodies of the world, and they want to show something which is matching their own status. I'll give you an example, like, uh, like for example, China used UNESCO's concept to put a 4% GDP for education, which they used this, as a, they used this fight inside of China. Now, a few years ago, they reached that purpose, they reached that goal. And also, and China now started thinking what kind of things now they should help others when they grow as a, a bigger power. And then we can see um, now what they have been doing now is uh, first, I would say, they start trying to do, introduce Chinese experience in developed ed uh, education system in, for other countries. And here, not only developing countries, but also developed countries. This morning, I was in OECD, and they told me that uh, you, you probably heard the PISA. PISA put the Shanghai students at the top. And then the UK, the Minister of Education, UK got an interest. And the last three years, they sent us teachers to study in Shanghai, see how Chinese teach their mathematics in the, in the school. And then they invite Chinese teachers to UK. So as you can see, this is also a benefit. Uh, the, even the South world start benefit uh, experience from China. Second thing that's been doing, they want to, they try to help the developing countries to do their capacity building in their, uh, their education development. You know, they offer so many scholarships for African students, particularly who study in China. And also they start, uh, another thing, the third thing I want to say, they will start providing financial support to developing countries particularly in Africa, to develop their, their education in Africa. One example, uh, in year 20, 2011, when our Director General, Madame Bukova, visited China, she met uh, the President, Chinese President Hu Jintao. I was there accompanied. Our, our Director General said, uh, Mr. President, we know you have a lot of uh, bilateral assistance provided to Africa. Why don't you do something through UNESCO? We can work with you, help you to implement your program in education in Africa. President Hu said, oh, that's a good idea. Okay, then he asked the Vice Prime Minister, say, could you follow up? Two years later, we signed an agreement. The first time, China gave funding trust to a United Nations uh, organization. They gave us eight million US dollars for four years to do teacher training in Africa, in eight countries. And we start. And recently now, because they're so successful, now they got another six, uh, six, uh, another six million dollars, not eight, sorry, another eight million dollars for another four years. So then is tot in total, we get a 16 million dollars for study to do the teacher training in Africa. And uh, including one country, we call Republic of Congo. Two years ago, I went that country, I launched that project in Congo, and then we invite the Chinese ambassador to attend the ceremony, and then the Chinese ambassador is there. That's a Minister Guan. So you can see this, uh, now this is what China has been doing for this very interesting. Now recently, I went to Africa, I went to Cote d'Ivoire, I went to Liberia. And all those countries, they're so happy with this uh, money come from China, implemented by UNESCO to do teacher training in these countries. And also we mobilized the Chinese company in the country, like for example, you know Huawei, which is a telephone uh, communication company. They provide a lot of equipment to our project in Cote d'Ivoire. And then they promised to do more. So you can see this is because this Chinese company also want to fulfill their social responsibilities. They want to use this opportunity to show the Chinese company come here not only for making money, but also they want to help. So this is another way actually uh, China has been doing. 
Now, the last thing probably I want to mention to you is that now China start getting actively involved with the formulation of international rules. I know there's some concern for economic part of if China come in, you want to create your own rule or you accept the current global, uh, the global rule, a global uh, mechanism. Leaks for education. Now, China does not try to create their own rule. Rather, they are much more actively participate in the process of set up international rule. For example, for this, you, we call SDG. There's a new sustainable development goal. And the China for education part, China actively involved with the formulating process. And also UNESCO formulated the same international convention. For example, convention on recognition of university degrees across the borders. This is another important international instrument. And China is a very, very active now say we want to be part of that. So you can see today China is much more active in this uh, process of formulating international rule and international law and the international mechanism. My conclusion, uh, in the field of education, I would say China first uh, was greatly influenced by the Western and the system. And also the second point I want to say is uh, its education development really uh, has already been a great uh, contribution in the last 30, 40 years towards the achievements of international education development. The first point I want to make is uh, uh, China has started sharing its experience with other countries, both South and North countries, and uh, particularly in Africa. The last point I want to pay, but say is that instead of changing the global rules, China start actively participate in the process of a formulate a global rule and a mechanism in education. I think for this reason, we should encourage and welcome the Chinese initiative if we want to make this world more peaceful. Thank you.